countdown is almost over. We are a mere hours away from the 2024-25 Barclays WSL season kicking off. Let's go. I'm Rachel. I'm Sophie. And this is Extra Time with Girls on the Ball. I'm super excited for this one. It's the second part of our Barclays WSL deep dive. Um, and we had part one earlier, which if you've missed, you wouldn't have if you'd subscribed. This is my plug <laughs> section. And so we always makes fun of me for it. But if you're subscribed, you're not going to miss stuff. So um, whether it's YouTube, whether it's a podcast apps, uh, subscribe. If you want to give us a review, leave us a comment. We'd love that as well. Um, or drop us a message on any of the social media apps. We're at Girls on the Ball on pretty much everything. Um, right, second part, so uh, And we're doing our disclaimer, which we did at the beginning of episode one, which was that at the Barclays Media Day, we were coming in from Portugal and the earliest we could get there was 10 a.m. And that meant we missed West Ham and we didn't get to chat to the West Ham players. So we're sorry about that. We're still going to talk about West Ham. But there is some West Ham content that we did with 90 Min coming out. So you won't miss yes. that entirely. So We took the fan van because the fan van is back. Uh, we took the fan van to West Ham's training ground on Tuesday. Yeah to do a bit of content with them so that was pretty cool yeah so we're not totally West Hamless um, but we are going to run through and we have a lovely new oh we do actually look signed West Ham shirt shirt see giving them an even extra plug now you feel like we're West Ham fans now we're going to get accused of being West Ham fans <laughs> last week it was Chelsea this week it was Arsenal now it's going to be West Ham we'll have to like we've got over in that corner over there we've got a whole pile of shirts of one kind of another that have we've amassed over the last 13 years or so so we'll just have to do like a rotating... Yeah, we're not going to turn the camera because over there is also everything else in this room. It's it's a mess. It's a stuff room. <laughs> but this looks kind of neat, uh, sort of, what you can see. Um, we are going to run through the final six teams uh, and hear from five of them, players slash managers from five of them. Um, and today we're going to start with the Blues. We're going to start with Chelsea, the holders of the Barclays WSL. Last season's finish, first... Uh, 55 points, fifth time in a row, and um, got to the Champions League semi-final. Who remembers that Barcelona heartbreak? Oh, Conte Cup finalist as well. They've got a new manager, Sonia Bonpastor. Uh, captain, we're assuming, still is Millie Bright. Um, and they've made a good few new signings. They've had a good few outgoings. They've also had a few go out on loan as well. Um, lots of youngsters getting minutes elsewhere, which is good. Um, some of the key ones were we surprised by? Lucy Bronze. Lucy, I mean, that was a, a bit of a surprise. I mean, everyone knew she was going to lose, but lose, leave Barcelona at the end of last season. It was the end of her contract. So I think it was, um, predict, it just was where, where she was going to end up. But I think she was pr linked with Chelsea pretty early on. Yeah. So it was a pretty quick one that happened. Um, I think they've, they've recruited well. They've done well getting some, well, obviously the French ones that, Sonia Bonpastor knows quite well. So and an attacker like Sandy Baltimore as well. She's very, very good. Um and that's exciting. And then some of the youngsters, Julia Bartel, has been at the under twenty World Cup with Spain. They got knocked out in like the quarterfinals or something or round sixteen. But <clears throat> she went she was there with them. She's a very, very good young talent. Same with Vila Boomen. She is a Dutch young talent. She is on loan. so she's been bought from PSV and mm -hmm. is now back on loan the next season so very much one for the future um so yeah it's a it's there's new faces there's um old faces in there i do sometimes i think especially with the news about sophie ingles acl um which i'm absolutely gutted about because especially i guess at her stage of her career is an absolute oh. heart wrencher um but also i do think it does maybe leave chelsea a little bit like in the middle middle area and that's not to say they don't have quality. They obviously have Aaron Cuthbert and Nuskin, who performed so well last year, can play pretty much anywhere on the pitch, but does look great in that midfield area. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've got a uh, young the captain, and she is so, so good. I mean, from watching her in the pre-season friendlies, she is so, so good, but she is 19. Mm -hmm. And I do believe you should trust in the kids and play play the kids, and I do believe she can do it, but it's just that kind of, there is always that going to be that question over consistency, especially when you're a team like Chelsea and you're going to be playing three times in seven days or something. So um, that's just my one little question. But then you 
counter that with having Sam Kerr coming back, hopefully before Christmas, maybe. Fingers crossed. Me official as well, coming back, around, maybe probably just a bit after Sam. Mm. Um, that's exciting. How do you manage that attack when you have those locked back? Because then ha- you have to try and fit Mirror Ramirez, Sam Kerr, in the carrier, official in the same team, in mm-hmm. the same position, in the same team. Um, and then you look at like Aggie Beaver Jones as well, who, yes, normally has played out on the flank, but can play that number nine as well. Um, yeah, there's a lot of moving parts, I think. There's a lot of moving parts, there's a lot of players. It's an absolutely stacked squad, and we expect them to be fighting on all fronts this season like they were last season which does mean we'll probably talk about Chelsea a bit more than other teams because they're in multiple competitions it's not because we favour them so I, we have to do a caveat there because yeah some people think seem to think that we um, favour Chelsea a little bit more than others but it's actually just because they go deep into a lot of competitions um, which I guess they're expecting to do this season I know Sonia Bonpastor will have her eyes on Champions League trophy again um, so yeah we'll see yeah, how they right. get on other questions like Lauren James and how yeah. that works because whether you play her out on the left or whether you play her in the 10 and the number of options now that are available to Sonia again, um, how does that look? And it's like this weird like kind of juxtaposition where they play a lot of games and they could play a lot of games if they get into the final stages of the Champions League Yes, um, and other cup competitions. But equally, the league season itself isn't that long mm-hmm. in comparison to, you know, other leagues around the world or men's leagues around the world. So um, with only 12 teams in it, it's 20, a 24-game, 24, 22-game season. <laughs> I love I watching your maths live. <laughs> I can't add up, but that isn't the longest season. So trying to keep everyone happy is going Especially to be... Especially And on. then getting within that, keeping everyone happy, being able to rotate, but then keeping the momentum yeah. and the consistency. Especially early on, because things don't get spicy uh, really until the second half of the season where we start to have games coming thick and fast. Um, but one of the players who's no longer a newbie, but came into the January window, so is still kind of a newbie, is Natalie Bjorn. Um, you spoke to her and she uh, spoke to you about the new season, the changes and how excited she is to get started. Here's what she had to say. When you look ahead to the season, obviously so much success last season in terms of the league. Um, how do you, you know, there's so much change as well with the club. So yeah. how do you kind of adapt to that and how much are you looking forward just to get going? I really, I am really looking forward to get the season going. Uh, we have had a good pre-season, we played some good games and we can feel now what it's only like two, three weeks left that it's it's starting to get real and I can't get, get wait to get started. And like I said, I think uh, the new staff and Sonia with everyone has really come in with like a good energy new energy something new to build on and I think for everyone in the team it's like a fresh start and um, so I'm really looking forward um, to see what we can achieve together and I, t- I guess that comes into the Champions League as well I know the round two just happened today mm-hmm. but um, going at the group stages and that's pretty exciting to get that started again right? yeah of course I, I couldn't play Champions League last season yeah. uh, and I was devastated for that but now it's a it's a new New season, new time, and yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be good. And give yourself a chance to test yourself against the best in Europe. Yeah, I mean, Champions League is one of the coolest and biggest tournaments you can play in club uh, level. So it's definitely something I've been missing. So I'm really looking forward to that. Good to hear from her. Um, she had a bit of a break as well this summer, which is always nice to hear when players get a bit of a break. Um, so yeah, I think it's gonna be an interesting season again for Chelsea. I know, you know, it's hard to look past them. It always is. Um, especially when they're stacked and especially when they replace Emma Hayes with, you know, a very good coach as well. The expectations aren't going to change for them. And they've them. done very well in pre-season, yeah. like beating Arsenal in um, the USA. Washington, in the USA. And then there was that 9-0 win over Feyenoord, Feyenoord yeah. um, which was impressive. I mean, Feyenoord are... You'd expect them to beat Feyenoord, but they are a, lot. a lesser opposition, but 9-0 is an yeah. impressive score. They are opening the WSL season at Kings Meadow on Friday the 20th against Aston Villa, 7pm. Uh, look forward to that one. Love a game under the lights. Um, and we will be there, of course, in the fan map. Uh, next up, Liverpool. Last season's maybe overachievers um, surprised everybody. They finished fourth on 41 points. Manager Matt Beard, captain Lee Fahey. Um, didn't have a very busy transfer window. Um, brought in Olivia Smith, um, Cornelia Coppocks, 
Uh, Gemma Evans, of course. I forgot about the Gemma Evans. You know when yeah. some of this stuff happens early in the season, like the Lucy Bronze, and you're like, my God, totally forgot that happened. You know when clubs do their business nice and early, then you kind of forget. But It's also been such a long transfer window. Yeah. Like, forever, that the stuff that happened even six weeks ago, <laughs> it seems like a million years ago. So. Um, they lost a few as well. Um, they've obviously lost uh, Emma Coy Visto who I thought was key on the on the flanks on the as in that full back position with Taylor Hines on the other side they always seemed so dangerous and played such a good role in that attacking flair um who else has gone out of Liverpool? Missy Bocans yes of course went to Aston Villa mm-hmm. um then yeah it's uh, and Mel Lawley went to Everton yeah um so there's been a few that have, there's a few more that, that have gone as well um but I think when we talked to Matt Beard he was very clear about wanting to keep the stability in his squad and he's done that. And I think from the outside, and I said it maybe about Manchester City last season, that it really worried me that they hadn't done all that much in the transfer window to freshen things up. But I do think, you know, it works both ways. And if a manager is happy, he's obviously gone out with the plan to only bring in a few, yeah. a few, mm-hmm. a handful of players and not change things up all that much. And um, he did say as well that he kind of felt like this was his kind of finally having a season of a, a full Matt Beard team, like a proper Matt Beard team, because when you come into clubs and it takes a couple of seasons, you inherit players, etc. So interesting to see how they get on this season and how whether that consistency carries on. We don't want to get overexcited. We have done it before. We have been burned before by teams who overachieve and then maybe don't do as well. But there's still a lot of excitement around Liverpool. Yes, there is. And there should be. I mean, as you say, they're not going to win... Well, they might now. Now I've said it. But they're not going to win the WSL. But they have everything about them to be able to compete. And I've always said that I think Matt Beard is one of the most underrated, but one of the best managers in the division. They play a different brand of football to most of the other teams, if all of the other teams, in the way that they set up. And I think it's, um, yeah, it's going to be interesting. They've obviously had that, you know, nice wins against Chelsea. <laughs> Um, so they're sort that of Chelsea's, an iconic game. Chelsea's bogey team maybe a little bit they they did well against Arsenal last year I think for them now it's um, and I think we've said this before about other teams is they've proven that they can perform against the big sides they had maybe a few like they even in the losses to Manchester City they performed well mm-hmm. in stages they mm-hmm. just fell apart in stages yeah. as well but it's about those teams in and around them and it's about getting that consistency and not, you know, they had such a good chance, was it in the Cup, um, to go through to the semi-finals against Leicester and at home. Yeah. And they just didn't turn up that day. Um, and there was a couple of other occasions where that lack of consistency really kind of told. I yes. I think as well, we're starting to see the fruits of their training facilities and all that kind of investment, you know, because it takes a little while to start to see in performances. And I think we're seeing that now. It's something Matt Beard has credited. Um, I did speak to him at the WSL Media Day. I asked him about, you know, being the disruptors and developing their style and and getting the team bought in so quickly. And here's what he said about that. Um, As the season as a whole, I guess, you know, we kind of spoke a bit about you guys as disruptors and we need more of that in the top three. We need more of those teams taking points off the big names relatively consistent, cons- consistently, I should say. You know, it's not <laughs> once, it's not like the odd time here and there. You're a team they almost fear now. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's, uh, I think sometimes you show your position too much respect, um, then you're going to get beat. You know, if you're preparing not to win a game, um, then you're probably going to get beat. I mean, I made two. I made a mistake when we played Arsenal at home and Man City at home. Oh, sorry, away uh, uh, just after Christmas, where I focus too much on them, how we can stop them playing rather than how we can hurt them. And I didn't do that again. You know, I sat down and thought everything we've done this year has been us, 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 us. Yes, we prepare for the opposition. Yes, we work on things. So yeah, def- definitely wouldn't do that again. That that that's that's what probably had a negative effect. In our, in our players' minds. And after that, we, we had a really good, especially May, if you look at May, what a, what a month that was for us. But yeah, no, so I, I, just, I just think, look, we just want to win every game we're involved in. I, I, it doesn't matter who we play. We know we're going to be playing up against top sides. I mean, we played Man City Saturday in a friendly and, you know, we, we were very good for 45 minutes, average for 10, 15, and then we've done okay again for the last 30. So, yeah, no, it's there. I, don't, I just think you've got to have a go. If you don't have a go, then... 
what's the point? And I think you and Robert Villaham are, are two managers who got, it just seemed like your side totally bought into exactly what you were trying to do very quickly, which, you know, isn't an easy thing to do. But they, there was a style there from the get-go and we could see what you were trying to do, even if every result didn't go your way. Yeah. I think um, I think this was probably my first, this like my team, I would say, yeah. since I've been back. Obviously, when you go into football clubs, you inherit a squad of players. Um, and I think this was probably the, the first year where I could say, like it was a Matt Beard team. Um, the players surprised me, like I said at the start of the, uh, of the interview, especially the younger ones. Um, some took their time to settle in. Herbie was just amazing. Um, and she's just grown and grown and grown. So, yeah, it's... Uh, and I think it's about the buying. I've just, it's, collectively, we just we have, a, we have a common goal. We want to be successful. We want to do well. Um, we represent a fantastic football club. And I think Melbourne had a big part to play because I think it shows... It showed the, how the club value the team. Um, myself, the staff, I mean, it's an amazing place to work. Um, and that gave us the platform, I think, to, to, to be successful. And it will continue to be that platform for, the, for us to be successful. Well, they are kicking off against Leicester at home in their new ground. They have a new ground this season, which is very exciting. Um, 22nd of September, 2pm kickoff at St. Helens Stadium. Thank um, God we don't have to go. I know they loved Tramit Rovers, Prenton Park. They loved it. And they had a very good relationship with that club. Yeah. But my God, I'm so glad I don't have to ever go back there again. <laughs> It's a tricky place to shoot uh, as a photographer. Uh, right, newbies time. Crystal Palace, welcome to the WSL. They, of course, finished first in the championship, got promoted. Manager Laura Kaminsky, who's been doing a sterling job there. Um, Amy Everett, captain. Lots of new signings. Lots of ins, lots of outs. Um, and, you know, this is the thing that just makes me a little bit nervous, just because coming up to the WSL is a big step. Uh, and then so is managing lots of ins, lots of outs. But they've got in plenty of experience. Katie Stengel is back. Welcome Kate, back, Katie Stengel. Really enjoyed watching her play when she was at Liverpool, so I'm delighted she's back. Josie Green, Catherine Vea, um, some good experience of players who've been in the WSL before and some exciting youngsters, and they're using the loan system really well. They are. I think they've recruited well. I think there was a, a minute, maybe, or maybe more than a minute, a few days, a few weeks in the... Um, transfer window where they didn't really do all that anything well they would have been doing a lot <laughs> but from what we could see it didn't look like they were doing all that much they were telling us what they were doing and you were kind of like uh, come on now you need to you know you need, need to buck up a little bit get get signing get get a squad together um and they've done i think they've done pretty well in that respect i think it's um some really astute signings i'm very excited to see my kato mm -hmm. play uh the young swedish striker um, I think, you know, she needs a bit of time maybe, but I think she could um, could be a star Any other youngsters? in this league. Uh, yeah, Lexi Potter. I mean, I absolutely um, love her as a football player. She, the way that she, for someone of so young an age, the way that she can control like, those midfield areas and, and be in those areas. So I'm very excited to see her back. Poppy Pritchard is uh, on loan from Manchester City, England under-19s. She literally can score from anywhere she's so direct with her running as well um and I, I think she, it, it's really good that she's you know having signed from Manchester City in that big move from Durham she can now go out and get proper minutes and get that experience under her belt in the WSL and Palace is a perfect place to kind of do that unfortunately for them the news today Georgia Fox has done her ACL in pre-season I think I mean there are so many heartbreaking ACL injuries happening at the moment and you feel for every single one of them. But for Georgia, who literally has just come back from an ACL, hasn't played in a competitive match yet, and she does another one, I'm just absolutely gutted. That's that. happened a couple of times with players. Do you remember Danielle Carter when she did her ACL and then she came back and I think it was maybe her second game Yeah, she came on you, that, and she and went the down? Right. And you just knew as soon as she went down? Yeah. And it's just absolutely, I mean, for especially for a player who's so young. Mm. Well, I mean, but she's so young, but also at the stage of her career where she could Cost be really breaking it in. pushing on. Yeah. And um, yeah, just uh, my heart goes out to her. Yeah, absolutely gutting. Um, 
We spoke to Abby Larkin uh, at Crystal Palace, asked her about how, you know, adapting from championship life into the WSL, how much she's looking forward to it. And we also spoke a little bit to her about her journey as a player. Um, she's a player who I remember, you know, we chat to when she played for Ireland and, you know, she she's young and was finding her feet with the media and, and how to deal with all of that. And she's actually, I think, come on, leaps and bounds. I thought she spoke really well to you. So here's what she had to say. It's a pretty exciting time to be a Palace player, you know. Yeah. The, what what happened last year was incredible and getting the promotion and mm-hmm. there's always going to be, I guess, an adjustment between the Championship and yeah. the WSL. How are you managing that as a sport? Um, yeah, obviously, you know, when we were playing Championship, we were like a ball possession team. You know, we had most of the ball for our, we were calm. Um, and I think coming now into the WSL, you know, against better opponents, you know, we're not going to have that much time on the ball. I think we're definitely going to have to just work on more defending wise um, and you know it's okay that we don't have the ball just you know be dominant in how we defend um, and obviously when we get the chance to play we'll play and show show all the girls what we're about Does that suit you as a player? Do you enjoy that kind of style of play as well? Um, yeah no I like playing out or yeah, um, yeah. yeah no I, I love uh, being on the ball you know just you know linking up with the girls I think it's it's great you know showing your personality on the field and I think that's what we need a lot we have a lot of that on the team so when you look at your career it's come so fast very quickly yeah um, no it is can you quite believe like wait how far you've come in such a short space of time um not really to be fair I've kind of moved quite a lot <laughs> you know came from Ireland to Glasgow and then from Glasgow to obviously here and then we're getting just promoted so you know it's it's been it's been quite a like a journey for me uh, in the past few months. Um, but yeah, I'm, you know, I'm settled now. Really excited to get going and feeling confident. She was actually saying afterwards to me, or maybe it was during it, that, you know, she came on to, obviously has been a hot prospect in Ireland for a long time since she was young. Um, well, she's still, <laughs> still ridiculously young, but since she was even younger. Um, and she broke into kind of that World Cup squad for Ireland, went to Australia for the World Cup. And the way that Ireland do media, I mean, it's a, honestly, I wish more people did it this way in, in the way that they put so many players up f- to talk to different kinds of media. So you have like your written section, broadcast section, audio section, whatever it might be, um, or content section. And each section will get four players on a pre-media day and after each game. And they would hold their own media days in the hotel mm-hmm about two or three days before the next game. And it really gave the media a chance to talk to a lot of different voices, but it also gave someone like Abby, who is, you know, pretty new on the scene, never really done that much before, a chance to really get exposed to talking to so many people and going around and talking to the different kinds of, answering the different kinds of questions. And as you say, you can you can tell that she's, she's so much more you know, confident in the way that she's talking now. Absolutely. Um, so their first fixture is against Tottenham Hotspur, away, 22nd of September, 2pm at Brisbane Road. So that's an exciting one to look out for, starting with a London derby. Love that. Um, okay, moving up to Leicester, middle of the country. Um, finished 10th last season on 18 points. And I think maybe at the beginning of the season, we thought Leicester might finished a little bit higher because of the way they were playing. Um, had to go through a lot last season with um, the Willie Kirk stuff, you know, a lot of disruption that they had to deal with. They've now got a new manager in, Amandine Mikel, who is great crack, really nice to talk to, very engaging. Um, I'm very lucky to chat to her. She's done some good business. Uh, Chantal Swaby has come in, someone else we've spoken to, got us me to ale on a permanent deal. Uh, Ruby Mace, which a lot of people are very excited to see play. And a number of French players have come in as well. We know the French managers like to just sprinkle a little bit of French flair on top of the teams. Um, what do you make of Leicester this season? You think they've gone about their business quietly and maybe might do the same yeah, thing? Yeah, I don't think my, many people are, are talking about what they've done over the summer, but I think they've recruited pretty well. I think bringing in Ruby Mace into that midfield area, she is one of England's you know, hottest young talents in that kind of six role and you don't really get the we don't have many sixes in in England so I, I do think going to Manchester City from Arsenal she obviously had that breakout season at Birmingham when she was on dual registration for Arsenal signed for City 
and then just really, really struggled to get any minutes whatsoever in the squad. Went on loan to Leicester, not last season, the season for the end of the mm-hmm. season before, um, and got her, you know, got minutes to her name, but also obviously got introduced to the club and turns out she, she really liked it there. Um, enough to go back permanently, even though other people were hunting down her signature. So yeah. I think for her to be able to now go, she's now 21, to go and she'll probably, if she stays fit, she'll be starting the majority of their games and to really get that experience and be able to flourish under someone like Amandine Miguel, who is known for A, her recruitment, but also her ability to develop, develop young players. Um, and for England, that has to be really exciting. She's with the under-23s now. But you, you got to be... You know, when when Kira Walsh went down in the World Cup and we all thought she'd done her ACL? Yeah, she went, I've got my knee, my knee. Yeah, and then she didn't turn, it turned out she fine. didn't do her ACL. But oh, when that happens, and we were trying to figure out how England solved that situation, having someone like a Ruby Mace in the backup would be absolutely key. And I think she's not there yet. It will take her maybe another season to get to that point. Mm-hmm. But the fact that she is waiting somewhere in the wings and we know that she's coming, I think, is a is a good relief for England fans as well. Um, but, yeah, I'm very excited to see what they do. Um, she Miguel has been at Ream for something like seven years, eight years or something. She got them promoted um, and she's done really well there. And she was kind of doing... 101 different jobs. I think she joked to the written media at Media Day that, you know, this is the time that she finds out whether she's a football coach or not <laughs> because she now has she now can focus on just the one job which is yeah. coaching on the pitch. And she's like, well, I'm I'm grateful that I can do that, but maybe maybe it will tell me I'm it will tell me whether I am a coach or I'm not a coach because um she can now focus all of her energy uh, energy on that so it's so, so exciting this is what I mean she's funny um, and uh, I spoke to her about why Lester and about the whole youth, the blend of youth and experience which is something she said is kind of new for her because she's used to having a lot of young players um, but this is what she had to say and why Leicester? What what was the decision? Um, decision? First of all I think it's a good positioning in England it's in the middle it's central uh, close to the countryside not not too much of a, a big city so that's good and uh, the facilities you know I mean the facilities of the club not only training but the stadium where we play in for the games and uh, the squad felt like um, what I'm used to a lot of foreign players and then um, a good potential to, to develop players and talk to me about your style of football and the type of football you want to play Ideally, um, offensive, huh? you know, everyone wants to score goals, but um, I think we need first to reduce the amount of goals uh, Leicester was taking last season. So there will be a defensive part, which is a bit more uh, boring for everyone, but uh, um, we have to make sure we take less goals. And then um, I love everything that's transitions, that's playing fast forward with um, fast swingers and and, you know, um, technical midfield and all, all, everything that's transitioned with. And you've got a nice blend of experience and youth in, in yeah. the squad, some really exciting young players as well. Yeah, but for me it's new to have uh, experienced players because uh, my, my age uh, group of, of my last teams was very young. So I'm discovering uh, players over, over 25. <laughs> it's new to me. I've got even some over 30. So I'm <laughs> so really it's a hello to Janice. <laughs> Um, so no, really, it's it's nice to have these those type of players to, um, I mean, uh, help the younger ones um, and be there for them. And on on I guess in the pressure moments, these players will help us a lot. And as you said, then the young ones is what I'm used to, and I, and I love young players because uh, for me it's the best because they 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 don't sing too much. They want to show. And it's uh, it's my my favorite type of, of players. Yeah, that bravery. Now I feel like I should have told her not to look at the camera. That she just needed to look at me. But she was <laughs> as engaging with me as she was with the camera. I mean, um, uh, and I was sitting behind the camera. She's so. very performative um, <laughs> and very nice to chat to. And I imagine probably quite a fun coach actually. Um, it's what is, all of them say when yeah. they're asked about her. They say, "Oh, she's very funny." <laughs> so I think that that comes across obviously in her. She's got quite an infectious nature about her. Yeah, and um, I also spoke to Chantelle Swabi about moving to Leicester 
uh, which I think is taking her a little bit of an adjustment to the location and the weather and such. Um, but I asked her about like the facilities uh, and how she's settling in at the club. Here's what she had to say. Talk to me about the facilities, because that's obviously, you know, something that you're known for, mm -hmm. not just the fact that you've got to play the King Power, but right. also the training facilities that you've access to. Yeah, I think the facility is probably definitely one of the best that I've been able to play at. Um, and I think it's just a, a great representation of what it should look like for women's football. Obviously, we were lucky to have had the men's old training ground, but I still think it's a good example of the standard that should be there for women's football when it comes to facilities. And on the pitch wise, how are you settling in new player, but also new manager? Right, right. On the pitch definitely was a, a few, a rough few first weeks, but um, just getting used to the demand um, of training, especially coming back from summer break. Um, but definitely been able to settle in. Um, she's a manager that I was familiar with um, in France when I played there last season. So um it is a new management, but I still think she kind of brings some of the French tactics that I had learned there. And I guess there's, she's got quite a few internationals on that team as well. So mm -hmm. have they helped you settle in? Yeah, definitely. Um, there's, I, I didn't realize there'd be so many internationals here as well. I feel like a lot of times there's a lot of just English players on, on WSL teams. But um, yeah, I know there's a bunch of internationals that really all bring their own characters throughout the squad. So they're definitely helping me settle in, just making me feel a lot more comfortable. So she's understandably getting used to things. She said she's family in London and she looks forward to spending a lot of time in London. So <laughs> um, I'm sure the weather, etc., is definitely an adjustment. Um, but yeah, it should be an interesting one. I think, you know, obviously, ideally improving on 10th from last season. Yeah, I think, so I think that's the real, like, I don't know if disappointment is the right word, but like, the, yeah, the disappointment from last year is that there was that massive, they were, there was so much to love about Leicester, like the way that they were uh, playing, the kind of bravery that they were showing, the courage, the, the ability to do something different um, and to try different things. And then it all went up and smoke a little bit because of the whole Willie Kirk um, situation and that's got to have a huge disruption on the squad and I know Omandine said has said that they reacted really well and I think they did they just got on with it they came together as a squad and and um, you know finished out the season pretty well but at the same time you've got to be thinking about those kind of missed opportunities the what -ifs. And, and how much maybe there was a disruption not because of any of the players' faults, but just because of the nature of the situation yeah. that they found themselves in. Yeah. So I think it's kind of good for them, to for the ones that are they're still there, um, to have a clean slate this season, um, show what they can do. They have got a fantastic bunch of players. I mean, you look at their squad, it's absolutely stacked. From like, you need a light sig at the back. You know, you've got the two Japanese players, Takarada and, and Mamiki. Who I absolutely, and Mamiki is just like an absolute diamond. Rantler, Petterman, you know, and then all of the new signings as well. And Janice Kamen, who got that experience as well. So I think Sam Tierney, I think, is one of the best, you know, young players coming through um, and was given a lot of responsibility last season. So I do think there's, um, yeah. There's would plenty. you tip them for your overachievers this season or am I putting two words in your mouth? I would tip them for a sixth place plus finish. Oh, Okay. Like that. Well, um, I don't know who I'm dropping out of that six. Top six well, we, but... <laughs> I won't interrogate you too much. Um, their first fixture, as you know, as I've already told you, is Liverpool away, 22nd of September, 2 p.m. at St. Helens Stadium. So these are the games I'm looking forward to. I think I said it on another podcast, or I maybe even said it on the previous episode, that these are like you can kind of tell more where clubs are at the beginning when they play those teams in and around them, um, as opposed to when they maybe play one of the top three mm -hmm. or four. Um, speaking of the top three or four, Manchester City, um, they have, obviously, we've come back from Champions League and um, Arsenal did not do the business, but my God, Man City did. <laughs> um, and they did it without Bunny Shaw. They've made him by getting on the score sheet as well. So we'll get into that because last season they obviously finished second on goal difference. 55 points. Qualified, of course, for the Champions League again. They've been missed. Um, Gareth Taylor in charge as manager and Alex Greenwood as captain. Now, as we said, Viv Miedema, the big new signing for them, got her on a free from Arsenal, got her from a com like from that competition. Like imagine like a rival getting their best goal scorer, top goal scorer in the league on a free. And still 
absolutely baffles me. Okay, they know, they know. But how I'm so are. pleased for Manchester City fans. No, it's not. It's it's more. It's not even about like the, the Arsenal. It's, the... it's it's more the the fact that what well, well before her injury, the best one of the best strikers in the world. It's still a generation of talent. The, the best creative player, I think, in terms of her ability to create from the ten and then score from the nine. Um, and playing the nine and a half, uh, just like so, yeah, someone of her talent is let go on a free. I just it, it boggles my mind. Our listeners will be going, we know, Sophie, we know. Um, but a super signing for Manchester City, uh, and when they bungled Bunny's visa situation, um, Miedema was there to step up, which is great. Most of them are there to step up. They're all scoring. They're all the score sheet. Jess Park, Chloe Kelly. Um, there's some really... The, the front of that team is very, very exciting. Um, unfortunately, uh, one of the new signings, Risa Shimizu from West Ham, did her ACL in pre-season. I mean, how many of these are we going to go At through? Olympics. At the Olympics, sorry. Um, but I just think, how many of these are we going to go through? This is what our second or third mention of an ACL in this episode. I mean, there's been a ridiculous amount. It's just... Like more in pre season yeah. than I've seen for a long time, and we've seen a lot of ACL injuries. And they're happening in the championship as but well. But just, it's just, yeah, it just seems relentless, and at the moment, it's just absolutely gutting. Talk to you about some of the other signings they made. I know we've spoken in the past about Man City's kind of stability, and they didn't really make any signings that much last season. We. They've gotten some depth in areas they needed depth last season. So when we think back to Buddy Shaw getting injured, you just think, what if, if they'd had someone who could slot in there seamlessly? They've kind of addressed that bringing in Viv, but the back maybe doesn't look as deep. Yeah. So the front line, as you say, stacked. absolutely stacked. Like, whether it's options in the, the nine <clears throat> or the ten or on the on the thanks. There's just, yeah, they've got... They've got a lot of depth there and when they click they're frightening and I just think like even like Jess Park last night she was absolutely ridiculous they brought um, an Oba for Gino as well yeah Oba for Gino um, very very good young Japanese player scored a brilliant goal in the Olympics um, and yeah they're very very technical as well I think yes as you say the, when you go backwards like towards defence and deep in midfield you have l- less cover. You know, you Hasegawa is brilliant, but she has to stay fit, I think, for the whole season. No pressure. If she gets injured, I don't know. You, you can find a few people, but l- letting Ruby Mace go means you don't have that cover in that, in that kind of area. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when you look at the back four, it's just a bit... A little, a little less. They did bring in Naomi Lazelle, who I think is... And Shimizu, but Naomi Lazelle yeah. is young and, and Shimizu is injured. I think Lazelle is, is one of the phenomenal young talent. I really do. I think she um, has proved in the WSL last season at Bristol that, you know, she can perform week in, week, week, in, week out to such a high standard. And she's got so much experience under her belt at her age mm-hmm. that she, she is a brilliant signing, but she won't be starting every game, I don't think. Um, and then obviously bring in Yamashita to back up Kiara Keating or, yeah, challenge, like, challenge Kiara Keating because Sandy McIver did her ACL, didn't she? So um, <sighs> last season. So she's still coming back from that, but it means that they were a keeper down. Yeah. I mean, they're still a keeper down because they don't have to. I think there, oh, no, they have Kate to start up now, so they're covered. Yeah. I think there was maybe a little concern with some of the pre-season performances from Man City of course they went out to Perth for that WSL meetup and um, I joke it's not it wasn't a WSL meetup there was PSG out there as well of course um but you know lost Aston Villa like I think maybe people were like oh interesting okay thought maybe and then they came out in Paris and did that and of course you know that was a really interesting fixture because we all know Paris FC is the giant killers from last season's Champions League and yeah. we kind of expected maybe more from them but I actually really want to watch that game because I want to know like obviously City were brilliant just by from what I've read about them and the goal scoring and I've seen Bibb's goal and I've seen Jess Park's ridiculous football footwork before she scored her goal well one of her goals um, and so the, clearly they were they were very very good, but um, I do think maybe I just have this question in the back of, of my head about Paris and whether we our reputation of them is based on round one and round two last season, and they didn't actually perform particularly well in the group stage. Yeah, but I think if you're a team that knock out both Arsenal and Wolfsburg, you deserve to get a bit of 
you know, they, oh, were, yeah, you they were a team that people were kind the, of a bit worried credit about. Credit in the bank, but maybe we're thinking about that team. Sure, but like, season. but I also think Man City will be thinking about what they did yeah, in yeah. pre-season, right? Yeah. So like, you have that credit in the bank until you lose 5-0. Yeah. So, you know, maybe next season, should they finish and qualify in the way they're doing, maybe we'd be less worried about them. But no, but that's why I mean, I, I'm not slating City. I just want to understand where Paris are at. Yes, of course. Because I, I, I think I have... 2023 Paris in my head. Sure. Well, I think many of us do. 2023 knockout, round one, round two. Sure. Rather than yes. group stage Paris. I, I'm picking up what you're putting down. <laughs> um, we've managed to do things kind of arse over tit, right? And it's based on the work we get in. So I'm just giving you a, a just to let you know. We clearly went to the wrong fixture last night and next week our work is taking us to Manchester. So we're doing Manchester's home leg when they're 5-0 up and we're missing what will probably be a big battle down in Barnwood when we could have gone to Paris again uh, to see five goals and then do the battle next week. So basically work has taken us the wrong way around so it means we're going to be seeing... But hopefully, slap bang in the middle, we'll get an absolute cracker of a game on Sunday. Hopefully. And do you know, do you know what I'm also City. hoping, which is my nice little feed in, is I'm really hoping it will give Naomi Lazelle a chance uh, to get on the pitch because we also spoke to her about Champions League, which isn't in this clip, but we did put it out about how excited she was to be in a club that would potentially give her the opportunity to play Champions League, which is really nice to hear. Um, but you did ask her about moving to Manchester City and also like all the learnings at Bristol. Because as you said, like playing in a, in a team like Bristol last season, you're going to be coming up against a lot and you're going to learn a lot. And I'm sure that's what made her a very attractive option for Manchester City. Here's what she had to say. How's the summer been for you in terms of pre-season? Lots of change coming to the new club. Um, mm -hmm. Very big signing as well. Uh, how was that whole process? Yeah, it was good. I think it was all a bit uncertain. Like I was back in with Bristol City for a month or so. So I got a lot of training under the belt, which was good before I came in. And then it was just an exciting prospect to be able to, to move to Manchester City and sort of an offer I couldn't turn down. And then coming into the team and joining the girls in pre-season, it's been really good. It's been tough, but um, it's been been really exciting to sort of get to know the girls, get to know the style of play and just integrate with the team and challenge myself. Obviously being at Bristol for a long time, um, last season especially was maybe in terms of results was super tough, but I guess as a player and as a defender, did you learn so much from that, you know, eight months? Yeah, I mean, it, it was a tough season. It was definitely one of the toughest um, that I've had so far. I think as a defender playing in a team that's doing a lot of defending I learned a, a huge amount and I guess playing in a league in the WSL you're defending against the best players that you can be so for me personally it was probably a good position for me to be in um, to sort of showcase my defending and also just improve a lot and um, I think that although we got relegated that a lot of the individuals in the team will have learning and um, positives to take from the season, even if it didn't end how we wanted it to. Brilliant segue, Rich. Thank you. <laughs> I was uh, working on that one in my head. So much so that I actually forgot where I was going and had to take a little break um, to figure out what I was saying. Um, anyway, yeah, I'm excited for Manchester City. Will they have made those little tweaks that they need to not lose on goal difference? Like, that is just the worst way um, to lose the league. They're definitely up there in the chat, in the top three. Who, which order is going to go? Who knows, but we shall see. Their first fixture is, of course, Arsenal. Uh, away at the Emirates, 22nd of September at 12 30. So both Arsenal and Manchester City, of course, sandwiched in the middle, facing each other, uh, sandwiched in the Champions League. Um, but at least Man City can kind of like oh, pressure off a little bit. It's like it can go one or two ways. You can score all your, your goals and Arsenal did not score all their goals. Or you can be in full flow and get Bunny Shaw back and score even this more goals. This is what I was going to forget. Say, so you're, you're going to either probably lose 3-0 or win 5-0. <laughs> but you've had Bunny Shaw up, resting her feet, like, you know, having a little chill. You guys off scoring five goals and then she's going to come to the Emirates fresh. So, and, and Arsenal, conversely, are going to be like, we've just had a shit day and now we have to go and face Manchester City. So it's going to be an interesting one. Anyway, we are on to... West Ham, who we have no clips for, as we already told you. I'm very sorry. Please, I'm sorry. Uh, last season, they finished a disappointing 11th. 
on 15 points. Manager Rianne Skinner, Captain Katrina Gorey, uh, Shalina Zadorsky is vice captain. And if you haven't already seen the pictures of the two of them that West Ham put out, they're very cute because they really lean into the height difference. <laughs> and Shalina isn't even that tall, but I just think because Minnie's so mini. Tall, but she's so mini. But also the way that they position them. Like, Shalina was in the foreground almost. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it made like, her look even taller. <laughs> um, Okay, so yeah, not a great season for West Ham last season, but I did see a few of their games, like a good few of their games, and I I know I spoke about this last season on various episodes, where there were times where you felt like the performance was there, or it was there for a half or 60 minutes, and they weren't taking opportunities. And it really, like, this is what happens. You end up 11th. And I can imagine there's so many games that they would have looked back on and gone, we could have, should have won that. We should have won that. We should have got a point out of that. We should have, you know, and I think having that happen a couple of times in a season is one thing. I think that happened too much for West Ham where they let a lead go or they wouldn't take the opportunities. Yeah, they can never quite piece in 90 minutes together, I think, was the issue. But then they'd go and beat Arsenal, you know, and then yeah. have a great game against Manchester United. And you're like, that's great, but do that against everybody else. Like, I think the fans would be like, oh, we lost to Arsenal, fine, but we beat six teams that were in and around us. Yeah, they, they did definitely have that kind of problem. Um, and I do think that Arsenal game, while it was brilliant, was also... An example of Arsenal not being able to put the ball in the back of the net. Yeah, as, as, well, as, as much as West Ham played really well and took their chance when it came, um, I think it was an, uh, like a... There was a, a lot of things, ingredients into that recipe. Yes. Um, but I do think, yeah, West Ham, they've always been this, and this is actually not really an indictment of the players or the, the coaching staff as such, but more about their aims off the pitch in terms of what the board um, have for them. And it's always felt, it's felt for years that they're just quite happy just to stay in the WSL. As long as they avoid relegation, that's the border uh, don't have really the ambitions or the willingness to invest in the team um like to try and push them up that table massively whereas if you compare that to someone like brighton who are so open about what they want to achieve and overly ambitious almost (laughs) yeah they might go about it a bit higgledy piggledy (laughs) but at least they they openly say that they want to be right at the top Mm -hmm. and they do kind of put their money where their mouth is and and try and get them there um, whereas I think, especially in, in what they've built behind the scenes, I think for West Ham, that needs to change. But I think the fact that they never play at the London Stadium is a big problem as well. I mean, it kind of just shows. And I know there's issues around like the rent of London Stadium and how much it costs to put the game on. But I mean, you should be having at least one game a season there. Um, I'm sorry. At this stage, you, WSL team should have. Guys, did you know that Sophie thinks that they should play at the main stadium? I don't know if she's mentioned that in a previous episode. I can mention it again. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> um, no, but like, I, yeah, I mean, that's just sad. But that's that takes away from, you know... It takes away from the hard work the players yeah. and the manager are putting in. And that's, as I said, it's not an indictment on them. It's I do think there is much improvement to be done. I don't think they quite got on the winning recipe last time round in terms of they can quite... And I, I think it really did disrupt them. You know, bringing in Minnie Gorey, uh, Katrina Gorey, and Christy Muris, but both of them, well, Christy was never fit. Injured, yeah. Um, and Minnie then got injured in the last two months Because of the it, it was January, like, oh my God, West Ham have done the business. And then suddenly, like, you saw it in games and then got, Minnie yeah. got injured. Minnie got injured. And I do think that disrupted the end of the season because the lack of cover um, at that point in time. I think they've recruited pretty well. Bringing in, you know, Manuel Le Parvi, I Nine think. new signings. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry, uh, Manuela Pavi is super exciting. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know when she's going to be fit because I know she did her hamstring the Olympics. So it might take her a little bit to get like fully fit on the pitch. But she is incredibly, incredibly exciting player. Um, getting Sadorsky in brings that experience. Obviously, Rianne's worked with her at Tottenham. So and had her. knows her so well and had her on loan last yeah. year. So um, knows her so well and really trusts her. You've got, you know, someone like Lee Meng Wen who's coming on loan from Brighton. Maybe we saw in glimpses Mm -hmm. some of what she can do last season, but she would never really got the minutes. And I think this is a good opportunity for her to to, to nail that down a bit. Yes, they've lost a a good few of them. Hanukkah Hashi, 
um, how is Sissoko, Mackenzie Arnold, like these were key players last yeah. season. I think that was the worry where you, you see them going, you're like, oh God. It's always these revolving doors that, that worry me where you... And it must be so hard as a manager though because it's like... You you're just, basically back at square, square one. Square one. Right? Um, every season, every like June, July, you come back into the same position and maybe Rianne didn't have it so much last year because she came in late. Mm. Um, but, you know, it's it's hard to re... like restart every single time with a new squad and it shouldn't be that way and I know she's spoken about contracts um, yeah. about the length of contracts I think it is changing in the women's game now we're seeing a lot longer contracts being signed you know you're seeing four year deals being signed these days which is basically the equivalent of an eight year deal <laughs> <laughs> for women's football because it just never happened back in the yeah. day um, you were always on a rolling one year contract or you, two years you were going to year to year yeah so I, I think that is key. I do think West Ham need to buck up their ideas in the back room to to help that situation for Ryan so that next year, come next year, they don't have the same issue again where they lose eight players or seven players. Absolutely. And they, of course, were on that Australian jolly as well, the Perth Cup. They haven't um, had the best seat pre-season. They haven't. But then I also don't always put a lot of stake in pre-season. No, and... I think you can tell little bits, but it's... You know, everything's a bit topsy-turvy. And I'd argue that, as cliche as it sounds, you'll learn an awful lot more losing in pre-season and know where you need to adjust than winning and thinking, oh, here, we've got this sorted. And then you, the season starts and you're like, oh, God, wait. So, yeah, I never kind of put too much stock in pre-season. But if you're a West Ham fan, it's not ideal. I think they've also got a good like batch of young players who came in last year, who stayed. So someone like an Emma Harris... You know, maybe struggled a bit to find her feet at times last season. I still think she's like one of the top quality mm -hmm. young players I've seen come through. You've also got Vivace, yeah. um, Ueki, like there's some if good they, players. If in those there. players can find their form and find it quickly, then. Put it in the back of the net. They were the ones that were like, the opportunities were there, they were creating them, and they just weren't able to go Then you can start getting those, that momentum together, and, and um, it just it's just a question of how quickly that takes to, to click. Well, they're facing Manchester United away uh, in their first game, 21st of September, 12pm at Old Trafford, no less. Uh, I do remember being there two years ago when they were beaten 4-0 at Old Trafford, so let's hope for their sake it's not a repeat. I do match. think first games of the season, though, it's always, and it's like what Anna, I was saying about Aston Villa in the last one, it's a free hit for West Ham, but it's probably your, not your best chance but a really good chance to kind of take things, people by surprise. Yeah. And before Manchester United get a chance to settle into their own rhythm in the season, you go up there and, and see what you can do against them. And yeah. it's less maybe formidable than if they were on a five-game unbeaten streak and you're going up to Old Trafford. Sure. I think it wasn't that last season they lost... 5-0 in their first game but it was a real game of two halves and yeah. then different story in the second time they yeah, played yeah, yeah. Um, so they'll have that in their locker as well they'll they'll know that they've been able to take something from Manchester United um, but it will be an exciting one I know the players are very excited uh, about playing at Old Trafford some of the players we spoke to um, in the fan van had never played there before um, so that will be a pretty special occasion for them to kick off their season right that's all the teams we did it Um and it's all starting today, this evening, uh, at King's Meadow, Chelsea versus Aston Villa, which will be at, will also be at Brighton Everton, and then we'll be at Arsenal Man City. City. So if you do see us, come say hello. We have the van, if you want to have a look inside the van. If you uh, want to come and spin the 90 men wheel, you can come and do that. Sounds great. Very exciting. Um, yeah, so if we'll be in charge of that, she's also in charge of the driving, because uh, Irish licence discriminated against, uh, couldn't get it sorted. <laughs> Um, but I don't mind, I can be a passenger princess and be in charge of the content and the radio. So, the radio, the, the music. The radio. Um, the radio, <laughs> Jesus. Really show me. I mean, here. your task isn't that hard. All right. Okay, well. Just play, play Taylor Swift to keep me on. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, that is the end of part two. Um, we'll be back next week to review all of the action. We'll be going live on Saturday, so plenty of opportunity to chat to us. If you have any questions for our Saturday Live, you can drop them to us at Girls on the Ball across all our platforms beforehand, or you can join us and ask us them then. Um, and if there's anything you want to talk about or we should talk about on Monday when we record after the weekend, um, do let us know. Make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss any episodes. And uh, yeah, leave us any comments or likes or anything like that. We'd love to hear from you until Saturday and then Monday. 
We'll see you very soon.